Hi, can you hear me? Good. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to come here and speak. It's a great privilege. I'm very pleased. And thank you very much to you as well for all um, not choosing to start your Easter weekend early. Or maybe this is how you're going to spend your entire Easter weekend, in which case uh, you have started it early. Um, this is uh, a, a talk about children and antiquarianism and antiquarianism and heritage. I'm going to be exploring the, the connections between those two things. Um, I should say at the start as well, a, a little apology, I suppose, because what I'm going to be ending with is a hypothesis, not a complete conclusion, but a hypothetical idea which I want to present to you and see whether you're in any way persuaded. I'd be equally happy if it turns out you're not persuaded, because then I can go away and think some more about the question. Hopefully along the way I'm going to be presenting some material which is not quite so hypothetical, which you will find interesting, about the connections between children and young people and antiquarianism antiquarianism, 20th century, 19th century, and particularly in the 18th century. But I know that many people in this room as well will have things to say about that, which I'd be very keen to hear about. Things about the way that children and young people engaged with the past, with the material past. You, many of you, will have lots of expertise in this area, and I'd be very keen to hear about it, because as I say, this is still work in progress. So where did it come from? It came from a project which took place a couple of years ago. Uh, the money came from the Arts and Humanities Council in 2013, uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council in 2013, and it was a collaboration between my institution, Newcastle University, and a number of other organisations, including what was then English Heritage. And uh, what we did, we had a brief, which was to try and work out ways in which digital technology, iPads, iPhones, all sorts of things like that, could be used to engage children and young people with heritage sites in ways that they weren't already being engaged. And we, we worked with Belsay Hall, which is that building up there, which is in uh, rural Northumberland. We got together, we had lots of meetings between the various, what I'm obliged to call stakeholders, that is to say the people who own the property, the academics and actual children, uh, trying to work out the ways in which we could try and persuade children to become very interested and active within this space. There were lots of problems. The whole point is that the English heritage and parents didn't want their kids just to turn up at this building and then look only at their iPad and not engage with the place. So our big challenge was to try and work out the way that we could use an iPhone, an iPad, to try and get people to engage with the place, to, to see through the place through different eyes. I'm not going to tell you about this, but this is just, we, we came up with an app in the end which is called the Wild Man app. And I'm not, uh, we, we, we got the idea from that from the wild man who was the uh, emblem of the Middleton family who used to own Belsay Hall. So I'm not going to tell you too much about this. The app is still available in the App Store should you want to download it. And you can use it away from uh, Belsay Castle as well. But the point is that this, is, this got me thinking. Doing this work about how to engage children and young people with heritage sites got me thinking about the history of this about children and young people, the way that they've engaged with heritage or antiquarianism in the past. And I don't think that has been written at all. If you look at the major books on the history of antiquarianism, you can look at the index and you won't find children mentioned. Antiquarianism, as we'll talk about in a second, is largely defined in opposition to childhood. That's very different from how it is today. If you look at any heritage provider today, like uh, the National Trust or like English Heritage or any of these bodies, you will find that children are absolutely central to their thinking. Go to the front page of the National Trust website and you will find 50 things to do before you're 11 and 3 quarters. You can do them after you're 11 and 3 quarters as well, if you're nimble enough to climb trees and build bivouacs and so on. But the point is that they are targeting their whole campaigns at young people. Their understanding is that only by engaging young people can you kind of guarantee the future of this, uh, the heritage in the country. And it's built into the national curriculum now as well. The national curriculum was redesigned a couple of years ago. Its history offering was redesigned specifically to take into account local heritage and to try and engage young people with their historic built environment and their natural environment as well. And another way of looking at this kind of close interconnection now is just to look at the statistics. There we have some. Uh, in 2013, 72% of children had visited a heritage site in the last year. And when you ask people why they turn up at heritage sites, they almost always say, for the children, for the educational benefit of the children, as it says there. So this is a very, very close connection now. That's my question, though. When did it begin? <laughs> 
And the answer, I find, is very difficult to ascertain. What I've been doing so far is ransacking different kinds of archives, different kinds of material. It's not complete, but this is what I've come up with. This is my kind of progress report so far about the ways in which children did engage with antiquarianism in the past. Now, it's certainly true that they were there before we get to the 20th century. Here is quite a celebrated letter from the Times uh, from 1881. I say celebrated because it uh, appears in the, the, uh, the book uh, the men from the ministry and it says sir permit me to draw attention to those of you who are interested in the preservation of ancient monuments to the present state of things at furnace abbey and it goes on the place was filled with a rough and noisy crowd of excursionists and this is the bit i emphasize there and a large numbers of children apparently under no control this is the best kind of evidence we have actually these places furnace abbey of course they didn't keep records we can't tell who visited the site because they didn't have visitors books which and if they did, they didn't tell people's ages. But we have this kind of complaints, not just letters from the Times, but other kinds of complaints as well, which speak about children climbing all over the sedilia and other things like that. So we know children were there using these places recreationally, at least in the early 20th century and in the late 19th century. Whether they were being engaged through school is a much more difficult matter to ascertain. I mean, remember that the major schools didn't have history on the curriculum at this, you know, the major public schools didn't have history on the curriculum at this period. Uh, it was only really starting to come into, onto the curricula in the early, late 19th, early 20th century. There were museums of antiquities, uh, at antiquities at places like Charterhouse and Harrow and Eton, but their history hasn't yet been written either. And we certainly don't know the history of the school trip. I've been trying to find out, I spent the last year and a half trying to find out the history of the school trip very difficult. There were some, definitely. We know that there were some. They were often to scientific places of scientific interest or economic interest. But when did this start? This is something I haven't been able to resolve, really. We have an image there of what may or may not have been one. There's no identifying details there. But the school trip, did, did children engage with, with heritage through school? Difficult, probably not at the private schools, unless it was through those, history, uh, those museums of antiquities. But we do know that there are uh, I've been able to find out some changes to regulations at places like the Tower of London. Tower of London, there are records for the Tower of London, a few of them survive, and we do know something about that. So here, uh, there are some regulations in, uh, about elementary school regulations in the late 19th century, which talked about permitting visits to, uh, during school hours to places of educational value. We know that the Board of Education waived admission fees after the First World War, waived admissions fees to historic sites. And we know from these records of the Tower of London that uh, that same period, there were a number of children visiting through, probably through schools on visits every week. And this got so bad by the interwar period that people started to complain about it. And there are plenty of complaints I've been able to unearth from that period about uh, the fact that it's these, that these huge numbers of school, these huge school parties are making the visits of everybody else completely impossible. And so they came up in 1934, this plan to limit uh, parties to 100 children from any one school so long as they were accompanied by a sufficient number of teachers. So we know that things are changing there. And we know, just going backwards, you see what I'm doing here, I'm starting in the present and I'm going back through the 20th into the 19th century. We know also that there were places like the British Museum were available as well to show antiquities to children. And children could be encouraged to visit places like this. Here is a book. Mrs. Marsett was a famous educationalist. Conversations on the history of England, 1842. She's telling her children, these fictional children in the book, but obviously this is a guide to parents and teachers about how they may educate their own children. She's saying, well, if you want to know about Greece and Rome, you won't be able to see these places because you'd have to travel too far, but I will show you some prints of them this evening and someday I will take you to the British Museum, a place where all sorts of ancient curiosities are kept and there you will see many Greek and Roman statues. And indeed in that image at the bottom, which is undated, we do see a couple of children in the British Museum. Now, that got me thinking about the British Museum. And what we do have from the British Museum is their regulations as they change over time. And this, I think, is tremendously interesting, or at least indicative of, the, of, of, of changing attitudes to the relationship between children and antiquity. Working backwards, 1871, no children in arms are to be admitted. But if we go back to 1828, no children apparently under 10 years of age will be admitted. 
back to 1803, and throughout the 18th century, all of the regulations you can see there ban children entirely. So just there, in the regulations of that one institution, we have a nice sense of how things are changing across the 19th century. Now, as I'm going to show, that prohibition on no children being allowed into the British Museum, that was quite often broken. But nevertheless, you know, in terms of the official rule on, on whether children were allowed to be engaging with the British Museum in the 18th century, the answer is no. So that brings me to what I want to spend the most of today talking about, which is what happened in this period, the great age of antiquarianism. The century of the founding of this society, the time when antiquarianism took hold among British people really, and when institutions started to appear, like the British Museum. Well, what about in this founding period of antiquarianism? How engaged were young people? Now, the obvious answer is not at all. I don't have to remind you, I'm afraid, about the classic caricature of the antiquarian in the 18th century. Uh, they are, as um, Rosemary Sweet has pointed out, they are almost entirely figured as patrician, Tory, Anglican, and she doesn't mention this, but I add this on, almost always adult, not to say old. You look at any of those caricatures and their, you know, their, their clear feature is their maleness and their oldness. In fact, you know, to be blunt, they're often seen, these antiquaries of the 18th century, they're often juxtaposed with death, aren't they? For comic effect, as you know in this famous Rowlandson image, but you know, the point being that the joke here being they're investigating a corpse, but some of them are almost corpse like themselves. The whole point I'm making, I suppose, is that, as someone puts it in this novel, Francis Book puts it in a novel, a young antiquarian, a young antiquarian, is every way a solecism, an error, something incorrect and inappropriate. We have this notion in the 18th century, no, I'm obviously not saying this is, this, is, this is in any way true, in fact I'm going to investigate whether this is true or not, but we have this notion, this popular conception, that you cannot be a young antiquarian. That antiquarianism is founded on the basis of age, experience, and wisdom. So that's what I want to explore. Is that true? Um, one way of looking at that is to say, yes, it is. I've already talked about uh, the British Museum. That's um, Montague House, where the British Museum was, at the top right there. And we've seen its regulations prohibiting children from entry. I looked at the uh, new attractions, as they might be called, in um, southern Italy, uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum. There are quite good records of who was allowed in there as well. It doesn't specifically prohibit children, but it does give the impression that because you had to write off in advance for a visa to see these places, perhaps because your tour had to be conducted, because you had to show your scholarly credentials, that it was not going to be easy for children to access those spaces either. Then at the bottom left there, do you recognise that? That is Strawberry Hill, or it's Walpole's um, home, which he opened to the public. There are admissions tickets which survive. There are a long list of regulations, and at the bottom it says, note, persons are desired not to bring children with them. This is all of a piece. Children seem to be excluded. The only exception I found, in fact, is the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the museum, uh, how do you say this, Tradescantendium, tra, tra, Tradescantium, which is you know, the, 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 tradis, the Tradescant's Ark, as it was called, what later became the Ashmolean Museum. And there, there is one piece of evidence that children perhaps used it when it was housed in London, in Lambeth, which is a headmaster from Rotherham, in fact, in 1660. He was opining that it's not fair, you know, you have, for a good education you have to go to London. It's the best place for the improvement of children in their education because of the variety of objects which daily present themselves and may easily be seen once a year by walking to Mr John Tradescant's where rarities are kept. Nowhere else have I found any suggestion that these museums institutionally allow children to enter them. But that is not to say that they didn't. And this is what I want to challenge, the notion that children were not actively engaged with heritage. One way to challenge that assumption is to look at the antiquarians themselves. The number of antiquarians in the 18th century is astonishing, um, or people who self-defined as antiquarian. If uh, I did a very simple search, which I, I don't have the figures to hand, I didn't write them down, but it is extraordinary. If you go to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, 
you can search by anybody who's alive in that period, the 18th century, and you can search by their what they, you know, their <coughs> occupation. And if you put in antiquarian and anybody who is alive in the 18th century, you get about 5% of the whole population of the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography self-designating themselves as antiquarian. Now, you know, that's a problematic figure in lots of ways, isn't it? Because perhaps that just shows the preferences of the people who put together the ODMB. But nevertheless, it's a surprisingly, uh, you know, there are a huge number of antiquarians, is the point I'm making. And they all, many of them, write their memoirs. And in their memoirs, they remember the time when they were children, of course. And remembering the time that they were children, they remember their youthful engagement with antiquarian endeavours. Now, memoirs are problematic. We have to take them with a pinch of salt. Who knows what kind of acts of self-definition and self-fashioning are going on here. It's very difficult to be absolutely clear about these. I won't read this out, but in books like Richard Warner's Literary Recollections, you almost always find a passage where they talk about the fact that when they were 12, when they were 14, they went out, they poked around, in this case, a barrow. Uh, he becomes fascinated by the olden time sepulchral brasses, shattered urns, antique brickbats, Celtic, Belgic, Roman, Saxon, Danish, and Norman potherds, potsherds, and so on. This is just entirely characteristic. And if we put all of these together, we get a sense that, yes, you'd walk out into the countryside, you would find a lot of young people digging around. Aubrey. Who, is there a more famous antiquarian? He talks about himself having a strong and early impulse to antiquity. He drew the stone circle when he was eight. He talks later, actually, when he's devising the best strategy for educating a young man, he talks about when a young man airs himself, either uh, horse riding or walking, let him be before informed of botanics and husbandry, but also antiquities. And therefore, an old antiquary or botanist should travel with the young man to inform him. So he's clear that you do need to be caught young, and as he was himself. I'm just going to press through a, a sort of, you know, three or four of these just to give you the general idea. Joseph Hunter is interesting because he came from a very different background. His father was a cutler in Sheffield, but he, was, he became an antiquarian later on in his life, but he was fascinated by antiquity in his own life, uh, in, in his own youth. And here we actually have some evidence that he's not just making it up later on because he kept a reading journal of what he borrowed from a circulating library in the 1790s when he was a young man. And it's full of antiquarian books, which he borrowed, copied pieces out of, and then sent back to the library. The Nichols as well. The Nichols, a great family of antiquarians, they started young. Uh, the most obvious example, the person who's best recorded is John Goff Nichols, third generation, who we know was here. Would it have been this room? Somerset in House. Somerset House, when he was 12 became a member of, the, uh, attended the society's meetings, presumably got doffed on the head with a mace. He was a school paleographer by the time he left school. He was contributing to antiquarian material to the Gentleman's Magazine at the age of 13. His sister is very interesting as well, because she keeps a diary, and she talks about how she and all of her younger siblings are being traipsed all over London, all over the country, to see an old house next door by their father, by their mother, by other people. You know, clearly these people were not being excluded from their family's antiquarian endeavours. Thomas Chatterton is another famous example of someone who caught this bug young. Uh, because he was such a celebrity, his um, uh, life was chronicled in some detail, and we know that he was you know, bewitched, as it says here, by the medieval, cultivating a taste for old English vernacular poetry drawn from a range of popular literary antiquarian works, was perpetually rummaging and ransacking every corner of the house for more parchments when he was a boy. That's Chatterton. The same could be saved of Scott. Scott is, I'll just read out that, that bottom paragraph, show me an old castle of the field of battle, and I was at home at once, he would write later in life, filled with its competence in their proper costume and overwhelmed by my hearers with the enthusiasm of my description. These are unusual figures. I'm not saying that they are typical of every young person, but it does show that you were not excluded from antiquarian activities just because you were young. They are unusual, but not as unusual as Charles Lamb. This is not the writer Charles Lamb. This is the Charles Lamb who kept a herd of guinea pigs. Have you come across him? 
He kept a series of guinea pigs and he gave them medieval names and he got his, his father's carpenter to build a huge kind of city for these guinea pigs to run around in. And he gave them all kind of chivalric in, uh, names and chivalric pasts and pedigrees and chivalric adventures to perform. I only put him there because he's so much fun, uh, but also because I suppose he shows this kind of, you know, how this kind of antiquarian interest is entering into children's play as well, or at least it is with Charles Lamb, born 1816, the son of a Sussex baronet. Those are unusual examples. You know, I'm not saying that they are typical, but where there is more, there is evidence that they weren't completely bizarre. That you would that that you would walk out in the 18th century to a site of antiquarian interest, to a ruined castle, a ruined abbey, wherever it may have been, or one of the buildings in London, and that you would meet young people there. I'm going to look at this set of evidence in in, in two stages. The first is by looking at the Grand Tour. In fact, we can't miss out the Grand Tour. I don't want to dwell too long on this because I want my focus to be on British antiquarianism. But nevertheless, young people on the Grand Tour is an interesting subject which needs more exploration. You know, what, uh, you know, of course, about the Grand Tour, don't you? This, 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 this um, finishing school for young men, as it's generally thought of, sent abroad to complete their education, perhaps before they go off to university, or perhaps they've, after they've gone off to, uni uh, gone off to university. Uh, and there's a kind of satire of it. You see... Um, you see the young, the, the grand tourists there at the bottom left, being surrounded by all of these um, people who are trying to delude him and, uh, in some ways, take advantage of him. This huge train as he arrives um, in uh, Rome. But again, the sense here, if you read the prescriptive literature, if you read the guidance, the sense that you get here is that it's not appropriate for children to go. Until we are five and twenty, little or no benefit results to the far greater part of those who make what is called the Grand Tour. You know, we think of it as kind of young men, perhaps aged about 18 to 24, not children and young people, but even they are being criticised for being too young to appreciate it. But what was the reality? And this is a question I don't think has been asked. Well, I think that lots of people were engaged with the Grand Tour. Lots of young people, much younger than we might think, were engaged with the Grand Tour. There are two ways of looking at this. One is to take the approach of some critics, some scholars who are now looking at the Grand Tour and to say, well, just because there was one young man who was, let's say, 20, going off on the tour of the, of the continent, doesn't mean that younger people still back at home were, weren't also engaging. With, what, with the Grand Tour. The point being that there was a, the, these families who were paying for an older son to go on, a, on the tour were actually thinking in terms of the family strategy. That man, that young man, would send letters home which the siblings at home would read, would benefit from, would discuss, it would be part of their education. In other words, what a lot of people are now saying is that, in fact, it wasn't just the young man, it was a larger section of the population, including children. A wider penumbra is the phrase that uh, one uses. Other sets of scholars who are looking at the Grand Tour also talk about the way that we shouldn't now think exclusively as of the tourists themselves, as the only protagonists in the Grand Tour. Instead, we have to think about all of the people who were kind of helping to make the Grand Tour happen, and that would have included the hosts in Italy, in France, in Switzerland, wherever they were going, many of whom were children. And in fact, we have a number of accounts of the tourists themselves running into children wherever they went, as you see in that picture of the, pro the, the road to Rome there at the bottom right. But that's one way to look at it, and you know I could explore that. But another way to look at it is actually to think that a number of children were on the tour. And this seems to be undeniably the case. It's undocumented. You can look at all of the books of the, on the Grand Tour and you won't see children mentioned, but they were undeniably there. We see them when we start to look for them. Just in an image like that. Lots of images, in fact. And when you start to investigate the people who are actually in these celebrated paintings, you find out that some of them are really quite young. They could be 16. Here's one who's 11. There's another evidently very young person. What about this one? A portrait of Louisa Grenville, age six. She was on the Grand Tour. Families went on the Grand Tour as a whole. They didn't just go when they were 20, 21-year-old men. They went as families. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this was the case and that 
the children weren't left at home. Uh, they weren't left in the home when they travelled either. They were taken around the sites. We know this from one extraordinary case, John Blathwaite of Deerham Park. When he was 15, he visited Rome with a tutor, and his tutor had to report back to the father still at home that he'd lost his son in the catacombs in Rome, and they'd had to go back in and burn his shirt in order to uh, act as a torch in order to try and find the boy so he could bring him out again. John Blathwaite refused to go back into the catacombs, you'll be unsurprised to hear, and the tutor was very apologetic in his letter, but it gives us an evidence that, you know, these were not, that the tour was not just for older, older, older men. Another very interesting piece of evidence is the other way, someone from the continent coming to Britain. This was Mozart's sister, his older sister. So Mozart, as you know, is touring the uh, country, uh, touring the continent with his father, but also his sister. And she gives, uh, Mozart himself, when he was in Britain, in, um, uh, was too young to write a report, but his sister does write a report of, presumably in defiance of the prohibition, being taken to the British Museum also to Westminster Abbey, Westminster Hall, seeing antiquities of all sorts, including one or two antiquities which are still available in the British Museum. You can still go there and see that model of the Holy, Holy Sepulchre, which is presumably what she means there as a, a, a grave of Jerusalem. So we know about her. And that leads me nicely to move from the Grand Tour onto tourism at home as well. This has to be more of my focus because I'm most interested in antiquarianism in Britain. And it is very clear here that, again, children were being taken around the country as a number of educationalists, a number of antiquarians suggest should be the case. Foreigners greatly blame the English for sending their children to travel abroad before they know anything of their own country. Sending their children to travel abroad, I notice, before they know anything of their own country. But they were also increasingly being shown around their own country. Now we get a sense of this from the imagery, just as with the Grand Tour, we can find plenty of engravings, such as this one, from the 18th century, from the early 19th century, which show children and young people in historic sites. Now you may argue that they're there not as documentaries, uh, you know, this should not be taken as documentary evidence, rather perhaps they're there to give a sense of scale or something like that. But nevertheless, it is an interesting kind of evidence which we might want to explore further. And we can compare it with journals and diaries, which are very clear that young people were being taken by their parents on grand tours of England. Lady Grantham, in 1798, engaged a tutor for her sons to take them on a tour of Yorkshire, on which she later joined them. Castle Howard, Revo Abbey, the boys then returned to Harrow in September. George III. Or in 1805, Dr John Fisher, Bishop of Exeter, tutor to Princess Charlotte in British history, paid a visit to the Tower of London with his pupil and her governess. So there are plenty of people being taken on these tours. And in fact, talk of the Tower of London leads me naturally on to some of the more celebrated accounts of tourism in the capital. The Tower of London, not only does it have probably the best records of any heritage site, still, uh, you know, the best archive of any heritage site in Britain, but it also was a magnet for people, for visitors going. We talked already about the number of people turning up in the early 20th century, but here in the 17th and 18th century, it was certainly already part of a tourist itinerary and an itinerary which children went on. Every time Pepys, in his diary, every time Pepys gets visitors who are children, where does he take them? To the Tower and to Westminster Abbey. And you know this famous quotation here. On his birthday, he goes into Westminster Abbey, he gets shown around the tombs, and he uh, delights in kissing the wife of Henry V. Do you know this? Her, her, her body was, um, uh, ex the, the, her tomb was destroyed at, uh, at one point and her body was therefore moved out and put in a kind of rather flimsy coffin in a completely different part of the abbey. And uh, for a small sum, you could, like Pepys, go and have a look at her kind of desiccated remains. I don't think kissing her was entirely encouraged, but Pepys decided to do it. That itinerary, though, the Tower and Westminster Abbey, became increasingly, well, it, it, it's, it's completely standard, completely conventional. And these places must have been heaving with children, just judging by the number of, number of accounts we have. Um, the Tower, in particular, they weren't necessarily going to see the historic buildings, of course, because what also was there was the famous menagerie. And they all mentioned going to see the lions. And you can see how much that cost. These were a tourist attraction, they had their own uh, rules, they had their own um, entrance, they had their own 
entry prices. And children routinely go and have a look at them. And you'll see there in that image, which is from a children's book of the early 19th century, children looking at the lions, looking at the other animals in their cages. The other place was Westminster Abbey, as I've said, and the tombs there at the end. We have an equal number, almost equal number of people paying to go, paying a small fee to a custodian to go and see the, uh, the monuments at the east end of the abbey. So just a few examples, I'll, I'll rush through these, but you can look at Swift. Children come and see him. What does Swift do? He takes them to the Tower. He takes them to Bedlam. Gresham College, where there was a cabinet of curiosities, and in his case, to a puppet show. In the Tatler, Isaac Bickerstaff takes three lads in a hackney coach to show them the lions, the tombs, Bedlam, and other places which are entertainments. This is my favorite. Um, the president mentioned that I'm editing uh, the letters of William Godwin from the early 19th century. Godwin is quite a serious-minded man, but we have his diary. His diary goes into his life in immense detail. There's a few pages from it. And uh, you will see that he, as a young family, including the future uh, Mary Shelley, as was mentioned, but, but, but four other siblings as well. And what does he do with them and his wife? He takes them to Westminster Abbey there. He takes them to the Tower. Uh, that says, that bottom entry says, Tower, with Mary Jane, his second wife, uh, TT is, is Thomas Turner, CC is Charles Claremont, his stepson, uh, and five, is that, or, no, and S, is that, I'm not sure, Beasts and Armoury, he sees. So everybody is going to these attractions with their children. That's a fairly routine uh, undertaking. And of course the tower still remains this extraordinarily popular attraction. The Line of Kings, which was the chief non-animal attraction at the Tower of London, this kind of armory, this display of armory as, as, a, as, a, as a presented as a kind of range of kings through the ages. That was there, that was a hugely popular attraction, and it remains so today. I see from the Tower of London website, in fact, the Historic Royal Palace's website, that it's now billed as the world's longest running visitor attraction. Which is surely open to question, but nevertheless, it has been redesigned for 2013. So, what we have what I've tried to suggest from all of these different kinds of evidence which we can put into juxtaposition with each other, none of them are convincing on their own right, but I think what we do get from putting them all together is a sense that children were engaging with antiquarianism on a number of different bases. They could be the children of celebrated antiquaries. They could be interested themselves in antiquarianism, either through their family or individually. Uh, they could be taken to these places as trees. They could be tourists, either abroad or in Britain, or when they come up to London from the provinces. But all of those kind of instances that I've mentioned in the 18th century, I think, are informal, individual. They're not institutional. As we've said, the institutions prohibited them from attending, and they're not educational. It's not something that's done through schools, it's not something which is understood to be an essential part of a child's education. We know that that has changed by the time we get to today, by the time we get to the early 20th century even. We have heritage as distinct from antiquarianism, which is very much directed at children, as I was saying right at the beginning. The question that I need to answer and the hypothesis that I've come up with is addressing this question. How do we get from that kind of individual informal engagement in the 18th century to something which is much more structured, much more understood to be essential today. So let me just for the last part of what I want to say address that now. For me, the key is children's books. This has been the surprising discovery of, of, that I feel I've made. It's something that hasn't really been noticed before, but it's about the extent to which antiquarianism dominated children's print culture. I, I work on children's literature a lot, so I can take this for granted. You know, I, I'm in danger of taking this too much for granted, but I don't know how much you know about the invention of children's literature. There are questions about it, and its history has kind of been yet to be written. But nevertheless, people would look at eight children's literature as an invention of the mid-18th century. From about the 1740s, there's a sudden boom in the production of children's books. Um, this is slightly earlier, 
This is uh, 1727, slightly before that boom starts. But it's a kind of harbinger, I suppose, of what is going to happen later on. This is Spiritual Songs for Children. And here, I just start with this one, because even here we have a, a children's poem which is talking about the kind of attractions that we've already met. The Tower of London to view, view the armour, Westminster Abbey, Gresham College. And if you notice what it's saying there, it's using these attractions to make a moral point. You can go and see the breathless shapes of princes and all the armour there but you should remember that they cannot move the breadth of one poor hand. At Westminster Abbey, uh, there are the bones of great people, but you trample on them, they feel no pain. In other words, all of these things are... Um, all of these things are not as significant as the spiritual. They're purely kind of uh, material remains. You should go and see them, but perhaps they should only adduce to your moral education. So that's 1720s. About the same time, uh, in fact, in the very same year, I noticed that this happens. There's a, a book which is published for young people. We wouldn't call it children's literature because it's too factual. You know, it's not a story, it's not poetry. It's actually a kind of guidebook to how you should live your life. Uh, you can see there in The Young Man's Companion, it's got, it has easy rules for measuring the board and timber. It has directions for measuring, gouging, and plotting land. It has a map of the globe has various observations on gardening. So this is supposed to be a useful book for young men to have in order to get through life. It's been published since 1681. But in 1727, something interesting is introduced into it. And that is a section on the curiosities of London and Westminster. This is an account here of old buildings, uh, the Temple Church, the Charing Cross, the Royal Exchange, Gresham's College, and of course the Tower, and of course uh, Westminster Abbey as well. That's introduced in 1727, and I think that's taken with spiritual songs, which we just looked at. This, this is the beginning of a, a new trend, which becomes very, very marked in the 1740s, from the 1740s, which is, as I said, the crucial decade for the invention, as it were, of children's literature. This is one of the books which defines that invention, or one of the, a, a series of books which defines that invention. Thomas Borman is the publisher. We don't know much about him. But he produced these books, and they're often seen as the first of the new children's literature. Books which are designed to be instructional, but also very appealing to children. One way that they're supposed to be appealing to children, as you can see, is this, their size. They're called Gigantic Histories, uh, is their name, but actually, they're tiny. You know, these are real people's thumbs and fingers here. I haven't, you know, that, that gives you a sense of the size. They are just a couple of inches high. It's supposed to be a joke because they're called gigantic histories, but in fact they're so tiny. But what hasn't really been noticed or commented upon is the fact that they are almost, in almost the whole series is a guidebook, a chore 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 how do you say it? choreographical uh, tour books, as I'm calling them. The History and Description of St Paul's Cathedral, Curiosities of the Tower of London, Westminster Abbey as well. It's intriguing that this children's literature doesn't, when it begins in the very early 1740s, it seemed the first books that publishers choose to publish are actually concerned with antiquarianism. That's not something that's been noticed before, and it's something that's significant because it's a trend that doesn't just stop there. It carries on throughout the 1740s and 1750s and throughout the rest of the century, in fact. A museum for young gentlemen and ladies or a private tutor of little masters and misses. It includes an account of ancient Britain. An extra, a very unusual thing to find in a book. It's not kind of, doesn't have a very obvious moral or religious slant. It doesn't have any particular applications to modern life. But the editor of this, the author of this, whoever it was, has decided to put into it an account of you know, druids and uh, ancient monuments in Britain, as well as the Seven Wonders of the World, as well as a letter from Jackie Curious to his mama in the country, giving a description of the tower, the monument, St Paul's, places which I remember to have heard much talked of in the country, and which scarce anybody that comes to London admits seeing. And so we go forward. I'll just talk about this one other example in detail, because it's so fascinating. This is 1746. So of the books which survive, of the children's books, these very early children's books which survive, this is one of the very, very first. 1746 is really early, just after the Borman books, which we just looked at. And it's called The Travels of Tom Thumb Over England and Wales. It's a tour book of England. Now, if we believe the preface, he says, Tom Thumb says, I've, very, I've touched very slightly on those particulars of old ruins, roads, and camps, 
uh, uh, which are so uh, thinking it's sufficient that I give my readers a tolerable picture of what every county and remarkable town now is without amusing him with fruitless inquiries concerning what has once been. So he's saying he's not going to have antiquarian material, but that's not true, in fact. Because as we go through this account of the different counties, there's a lot in each county which is antiquarian. And there's a lot, which is really strikingly, which is incredibly up to the minute. Here, obviously, I went to Wiltshire, and I had a look at the entry for Wiltshire, and there there's a normal description of the, the buildings you can find there, the landscape, but also of Stonehenge and Avebury. And he mentions by name the ideas of Aubrey and of Stukeley. This is 1746, so Stukeley has only published on Stonehenge and Avery just a couple of years previously. This is surprising, very extraordinary stuff to write, I thought, in a children's book. And this tour book tradition continues. I'm just going to flip through these because you'll, you'll get a sense of, of the proliferation of them in the second half of the um, 18th century. Uh, what have we got there? A family tour, or the juvenile tourist. Um, England delineated, or a geographical description. The travels of a British druid. Relics of antiquity, the ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Reuben Rambles, uh, travels through the counties of England. The Cambrian excursion, loiterings in the lakes of Cumberland. Any, you know, this is not something which has been understood so far, but if you were to look at a, you know, if you were to undertake a full bibliography of the books produced for children in the second half of the 18th century, early 19th century, I think an extraordinary number of them would be tour books of this kind, which set out to teach children about the antiquarian attractions of Britain, and in some cases, a further afield. There's one I'll just end of. Wonders, descriptive of some of the most remarkable in nature of art, and there we have Stonehenge with verses underneath it published by John Harris in the 1820s. Okay. What am I concluding? This is a very intriguing quotation, isn't it? Um, Heritage is the rock out of which the nation's children will be hewn, said Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister uh, between the wars. I've read that quotation loads and loads of times, and I still don't really understand it. Not totally sure what he's saying and how we should interpret it heritage there, but it does occur in. I, I got this quotation from Simon Thurley's book, uh, The Men from the Ministry, again, History of Heritage in Britain. He doesn't give any um, uh, citation for it, so I don't know where it comes from. But it's a very suggestive quotation in that, in that period, the 20s and probably the 30s, heritage, at least if we understand that word as we do today, Heritage is, is being seen as central to teaching children about the nation and to making them the kind of citizens of the future. Baldwin thinks that in the 20th century, it seems. How do we get there, though? That's the question. How do we get there from the 18th century to those 20th century needs? The conclusions that we can draw are that, I think, in the 18th century, it's not the case that children are excluded. As I've tried to show, Antiquarianism is not just an exclusively adult preserve. I mean, we used to think of it as an exclusively male preserve, no women involved, but Rosemary Sweet has shown them that's not the case. We used to think of it as an entirely patrician and upper-class activity. Again, that's been shown not to be the case. And we can now do, I think, the same with childhood and young people. We can say that we used to think of antiquarianism, even in the 18th century, as something which only adults engage with, but I don't think that's the case. There were young people too. That's one conclusion problem was that it didn't seem to be institutional. As I said earlier, it was informal, it was individual in the 18th century. But what I'm arguing, and what I'm inviting you to believe, and you may wish to disagree with me, is that it's children's books which are the key to understanding how we get to Baldwin's position from this 18th century position. Because it's in these children's books, not at the sites themselves, not in museums, and certainly not in schools, that antiquarianism was being translated, if you like, or transmuted into something which is more amenable to children and to young people. It's in print culture that we need to look for our answers there. So if we're asking how we get from that position to that position, we can come up with a sort of formula. And I know this is a very problematic and oversimplified formula, but I'm thinking that if we start from a position of you know, what antiquarianism is, we can't get to Baldwin's and the 20th century idea of heritage without adding in children. 
children seem to be this kind of what transfers something which is scholarly and um, y y you should be undertaking as a kind of uh, as a pastime to something which is of national importance, something which actually is kind of for the betterment of the whole of society. And I think the kind of what the missing thing that allows antiquarianism to turn into heritage is this kind of decision that it needs to be made more appropriate to children. But as I'm saying, and this is my final point, I think it's print culture which is the catalyst for allowing that to happen. It's in children's books that we see the educational potential of antiquarianism being explored. Not that they're trying to get rid of its fun value. Not that they're trying to make it something which we can't uh, appreciate, and, uh, which children can't appreciate and enjoy. No, actually the children's books are rather successful at fusing the two. Children's books are all about instruction and delight, and we see that in their approach to antiquarianism as well. They understand in the children's books that this is something which is educational for the good of the individual and for the good of society, and that it can also be fun. And that's why I'm arguing that it's children's books which allow that process to happen. It may have happened anyway, but it's children, you know, over a longer period, but it's in children's literature which we can search for this kind of way in which the classic 18th century antiquarianism is transmuted into something which is much more appropriate for children and young people to engage with, but also which is understood as something which they ought to engage with. And that's the hypothesis I'm presenting to you at the end, and I wonder what you think of it. Thank you very much.